Well, this is Casey Gronevelt. We are now on lesson three of our topic, Dispensations. Vitally important topic. There's our scholar, our Bible student, studying away, trying to identify problem areas. So in this third lesson, let's solve some problems. First of all, here's our poor man. He's tried to study the Word of God. He doesn't quite know what he's doing. He's gone through the whole Bible and I, I, I just give up. I give up. I've had it. This thing is just chock full of confusion and contradictions. Some of the stuff I read in the Old Testament is contradicted by things in the New Testament. And it's really puzzling. Especially this whole area dealing with Paul and the mystery and things like that. Well, let's see if our study of dispensations can help this person. Well, let's take problem number one. This is a big one. There's our scholar. He's got his hands up like this. He's kind of confused. Big question in his mind. His problem is all this salvation. Is it with or without works? As I go through the Bible, it's very confusing. What must I do to be saved? Well, let's see if we can solve some of these problems. First of all, a wonderful booklet is called The Greatness of Salvation by Robert Brock. He brings out two key things. One, we are saved by faith. The second key thing, faith is taking God at his word. Whatever he tells us to do and we do it shows our faith. Then through faith comes our righteousness. Well, let's go back to lesson two. Remember Noah? Look at Noah. There he is building the ark. In Hebrews 11 verse 7. It says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family and became heir of righteousness that comes by faith. He followed the instructions of God to build an ark that showed his faith and that gave him righteousness. Remember too another one we studied was Abram, Abraham, Hebrews 11. Again now looking at verse 8. By faith Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance he obeyed and went. That work showed his faith. It says, even though he did not know where he was going, there was faith. Oh, worse yet, he was ordered to sacrifice his son. And what happened there? Verse 17 in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, he was ready to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice and then God provided a substitute. So Abraham was tested and he passed the test. One more. Let's take a look at Peter. Now we're moving up into the New Testament. Remember Peter chapter 2 in the book of Acts? Oh they were saying Peter, Peter what must we do? What must we do to be saved? Well here it came. Acts 2.38 Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. This was ordered from God. If they would do that, do this work, they would have the forgiveness of their sins. So you see, it was all based on faith. But quite often back then, the faith was involved with a series of works to be performed. Well, faith plus 
works. There we have the first dispensation, innocence, second one, conscience, third one, human government, you know, one after another the people failed. Another one was promise, another one was law, and then would come the kingdom. Now what's interesting here, God required during this period of time, works, ceremonies, ordinances of all kinds and types, rituals they had to go through with the sacrifices and all of that, washings of various kinds, the sacrifices themselves, tithings, offerings, and the law which they were to follow to the letter. All these were requirements by God, and it was faith plus works. Well, let's take a look at some of the restrictions the Jewish people had. One, Gentiles could not take part in Israel's worship unless they were circumcised and literally became a Jew. Two, any uncircumcised man was considered unclean, so they stayed away from the Gentiles. Three, they were forbidden to eat any food the Gentiles ate. And four, the slightest infraction of the law defiled the Jew. So oh, there were all kinds of ordinances and works involved in their religious system. Well, there it is again, our dispensations all of them in red. There's the world. God's purpose throughout this time period was to establish his kingdom on earth. But then came the dispensation of the grace of God. Now this was different. It had nothing to do with prophecy. God's purpose with this dispensation is totally different, is to establish the body of Christ in the heavenlies. Well, the dispensation of grace, this is faith alone. It has nothing to do with works. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Well, <laughs> take a look at our guy here. He's all puffed up. Very important person. Beautiful verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. What does Paul say? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works. Why not by works? So that no one could boast. Oh, look at him. Oh, I've been baptized. Oh, I've joined the church. I've done this and I've done that. It's almost like they want to take credit or a big part of the credit for their salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. Faith alone. A dispensational theology by Baker in this dispensation, Baker says this now, God does not say, believe and offer sacrifices. He does not say, believe and be baptized. He does not say, believe and be circumcised. Faith is now in the finished work of Christ. Baker goes on. Faith accepts the fact that Christ has done all of the work necessary for salvation. And therefore it simply rests in a completed work. Christ has done it all. Isn't that beautiful? Let's take a look at another problem. Problem two. Well, what do we have here? There's a teacher, scholar. What's he saying? Which gospel. Well, remember, a person goes through the Word of God and bumps into something very strange. There he is working away, and guess what he sees? Huh, all kinds of gospels. 
popping up all over the place. There is the gospel of the kingdom. There is the gospel of the circumcision. There is what is called Paul's my gospel. There's another one, gospel of the grace of God. Another one, gospel of Christ. We have the gospel of peace. We have gospel of the uncircumcision. And then we have the everlasting gospel. Then another one called the gospel of your salvation. Another one, gospel of the kingdom of God. Another one, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of his son. Well, pretty soon it gets a little confusing. Which one applies to what and who, what, when, where, and why? Well, let's separate them by dispensation. We'll see if this makes a little sense. So the dispensation of the law, that one has gone on for a long time. Under that would fall the gospel of the kingdom. Also, it is called the gospel of the kingdom of God. These started with the Davidic covenant. Key is the law of Moses. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4, 23. Gospel of the circumcision. This was one of Israel's religious rites that they had to perform. The gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, Galatians 2, 7. Then the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this is the gospel presented when he was here on earth in bodily form, and this refers only to the kingdom. Well, let's just take a look at Peter. Peter's gospel. His gospel was the Mosaic law. In Galatians 2, 7, what do we read? As the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. That was his gospel. This meant this gospel was to be presented to the Jew. Christ had Two ministries. Now we touched on this before. But this is so vitally important. One was his earthly ministry. When he came to earth, born as a little baby and so forth, up until the time of the crucifixion and his death. His was an earthly ministry to the nation Israel. Look at Acts Chapter 1, verse 6. This is after Christ had risen from the dead. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is what Christ had been preaching and teaching them all the time he was here on earth. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is what they were waiting for. That's why we call this the gospel of the kingdom. Now, the other ministry was a heavenly ministry. And this was concerning the body of Christ. This ministry came about after Christ converted Saul. Brand new. Something entirely new. It was revealed to Paul and Paul alone. The apostle to the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. That's why I follow Paul, as Paul followed Christ. This has absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom ministry or prophecy. None of this can be found in the Old Testament or in the four Gospels or even in the book of Acts. 
This is the gospel of the grace of God. See the difference in the two? Two of the great gospel, gospels of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. Again, let's separate them by dispensation. Now we're looking at the dispensation of grace, grace of God. What falls under there? The gospel of the grace of God. The ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This is Paul now. Acts 20, 24. Another one. My gospel. This is what Paul says. Why does he say that? Because Paul alone received it. It never went to the twelve. It never went to the deacons. It went to Paul. Another one, the gospel of the uncircumcision. Well, the Gentiles are the uncircumcision. The other gospel of the kingdom was to the Jew. They saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, says Paul, in Galatians 2.7. Another one, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye received, or believed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 The gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed. So you see, it's based on belief. There's our faith. Believe all we had to do. And another one, the gospel of Christ. Now, this one here is dealing with the grace, not the kingdom. Well, let's take a look at Paul's gospel. We looked at Peter's. Paul's gospel is grace. Galatians 2.7 when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, or to the Gentiles, was committed, says Paul, to me. Well, let's take a look at another problem. Oh, this is a, a fantastic one. There's a little professor. When did the body of Christ start? Oh, this has caused more turmoil and denominations and churches for decades. Some say, oh, it started way back in Genesis. Some say, no, at the cross. It's all over the place. Big question. People search the Word of God and can come up with several different places where they believe the body of Christ started. Well, why is Pentecost so important? Very simple. Over 90%, and some believe this is 95% of all believers are convinced that the body of Christ began at Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came down. They could speak different languages. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This has been the biggest handicap to effective Bible study for years. That's why we have to look into this problem. Well, there's our man, finger up in the air. Well, then, when did it start? Well, my attitude is, let's turn this around. Well, what do you mean by that? How do you turn it around? Oh, simple to do. Here's the way I'm going to phrase it. When the body of Christ did not start. That may lead us to when it did start. Well, first of all, let's see what is involved in this thing called the body of Christ or the mystery. Number one, very important, the Son, Jesus Christ. The Son redeemed us through His blood. That's one of the key parts of this mystery. Another part of it, look what it says. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, 
Ephesians 1 7. Now remember, we were born with Adam's sin. Plus, we picked up our own sins along the way of our life. And there came the cross. And with the cross comes the blood of Jesus Christ. And this blood forgave us our sins. Past, present, future. Gone forever. Well, when was this preached? Another part of this mystery fellow heirs. Oh, this is a good one here. Look at this. Ephesians 3 6. It says the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Oh, that's something new. Members together of one body, this body of Christ, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So here is something completely different. Jew and Gentile are now one in Christ. Both have access to the body of Christ the same way. This is part of the mystery. One more part of this mystery is what I call the body of Christ. I use this because Paul uses the human body as an example. Here is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. The head right now is in heaven. We are members of the body of Christ. Just like, says Paul, the cells in the human body. This body is slowly being built to completion. And there is also the nervous system shown in black here, which represents the Holy Spirit. This is what ties us to the head, which is Christ. Brand new thing, never prophesied. And what does it say in 2 Corinthians 5.17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. This is one of the most fantastic things, the body of Christ. Okay, now, when did the dispensation of grace start? Well, let's take a look. There's a cross. But we'll know it started when it was announced. If you don't announce it, nobody knows about it, and it cannot start. So let's see if we can find out when this whole concept of the mystery, which we just talked about in the last four slides, when was it presented? Okay, when did it start? Here we go. Christ was crucified, went into the grave, and he rose from the dead. Oh, what an opportunity here. Passover. Forty days Christ spent, the risen Christ spent with the disciples and so forth. Acts 1 3, he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about what? The blood of Christ, the body of Christ, the beautiful thing called reconciliation. No. He didn't mention one thing about that. Because the Bible says he spoke about the kingdom of God. This was still the gospel that was being presented. Then Christ ascended. Ten days later, Pentecost came. Well, up to this point now, there's nothing here about the cross, the blood, or the mystery. Well, let's move on. When did the dispensation of grace start? Well... Let's go one step further. We move along now 
to what must I do to be saved? This came about in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Here's Peter. Here Peter is speaking to this group of Jews that have come from all over the known world, which they had to do because of the Feast of Pentecost. What an opportunity to tell them about the blood of Christ and all of this. What does Peter say? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now isn't that strange? Nothing here about the cross or the mystery. Well, let's move on a little further. Now here is something very interesting. The kingdom is offered to Israel. This happens now in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, the times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that He may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. This is the offer of the kingdom to Israel. Nothing here about the cross or the mystery. Charles Baker in his Dispensational Theology, look what he says. This was the first real offer of the kingdom given to Israel. If they would only repent of their rejection of Jesus Christ, God will send Christ back. Well, that didn't work. When did the dispensation of grace start? Well, let's go one step further. Oh, this is something here. We're now moving up to Acts chapter 7. Stephen before the Sanhedrin. Remember, Stephen was one of the deacons. He appeared before, I would call it, the Supreme Court of Israel. All the religious leaders and so forth were there. Stephen, the Bible says, had the face of an angel. He was full of the Holy Spirit. What an opportunity for Stephen to stand up before them and tell them about the blood of Christ, the message of reconciliation. But they were accusing Stephen of blasphemy. Well, Stephen, in Acts 7, 52 and 53, turns the tables and attacks them. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they had slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. In other words, Stephen, just like Peter, is accusing the nation Israel of being the betrayers and the murderers of Christ. And look what it says. You Jews who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and you have not kept it. Oh, this is fantastic. Nothing here about the cross or the mystery. In fact, this is one of the most dramatic chapters in the whole New Testament. While Stephen was talking to them, he said, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And I believe here Christ would have returned and set up the kingdom if they would have believed. What was their reaction? They hauled Stephen out of the city and stoned him to death. This is a crucial point. Israel rejected God in the Old Testament. Down comes the second part of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. They not only rejected him, they put him to death, demanded Pilate kill him. And Christ said, when I go up, I'll send down the Comforter. Down comes the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 7, they reject the Holy Spirit. They reject the offer of the kingdom. And here's where things turn around. They haul out Stephen, stone him to death. Now, can we go further? 
when did the dispensation of grace start? <laughs> I haven't seen it announced so far. Let's go one step further. This takes place in Acts chapter 9. It's called Saul's conversion. In Acts 22, Paul is before one of the kings and he is explaining to them what happened to him. Christ came down. Paul must have fallen off of his horse. He was blinded. He was taken into the city. And Ananias was let in on what was going on. And Paul says, Ananias came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What an opportunity Christ had here to tell Paul, oh boy, you're saved by the blood of Christ. And the... No, nothing was said. Even at the conversion of Saul, nothing here about the cross or the mystery. Now, up to now, there has been no mention of the body of Christ. No mention of the rapture, the catching away of the body of Christ when it's complete. No mention of the concept of reconciliation, Jew and Gentile. They were still separated. No concept or mention of the new location of paradise in the third heaven. Nothing about the baptism by the Holy Spirit which puts us into the body of Christ. The baptism of Acts 2 was with the Holy Spirit by Christ. Nothing about the dispensation of the grace of God and nothing about salvation without works. Well, <laughs> where are we? You see, Saul was saved under the law. And then, with progressive revelation, little by little, Christ and the Holy Spirit brought Paul up to speed on this new thing he was to present. Now, the conversion happened in Acts chapter 9. Here's the thing called the body of Christ. When did it start? Well, all I can say is this. It started in mid-Acts. There is chapter 9, the conversion of Paul. There's chapter 13, when him and Barnabas are sent out. Where did it start? All I can say is this. It could not have started before chapter 9. Because all this had to be revealed to Paul after he was saved. Now, did it start at 9? Did it start at chapter 13? That's for another lesson. And now comes problem number four. Oh, there's a fella, Bible under his arm. What's he got there? It says, Israel, what's going on here? Well, it's quite simple. The problem is this, taking what belongs to Israel. This is one of the biggest problems amongst denominations today and all the different churches. They all want a hunk of what belongs to Israel. They love to say, but we are spiritual Israel. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. Well, let's take a look. I call this the doctrinal shopping center. What's here? Remember the Great Commission, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so forth. Look what it says up here. All these things. Cast out demons, sell what you have, heal the sick, drink poison, speak in new languages, handle serpents, raise the dead. A lot of people say, we follow the Great Commission. But, 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 I don't want this one. I, I, I know I can't raise the dead. And some speak in tongues, some don't. Some handle serpents, some don't. What a mess. Then the baptism. Oh, to receive the Spirit witness to others, after salvation, for salvation, church membership, child baptism. It's confusing. 
What type of baptism? Pour, immerse, sprinkle, dry. And we can go on. Who to follow? Oh, we follow Jesus. We follow Peter. We follow Moses. We follow John. What type of salvation? Repent plus baptism? Remission of sins? Obey the law? All of these things were given to Israel, not to the Gentiles. Much of this came through the Old Testament with the law and what Christ was preaching when he was alive here on earth. All of this was given to Israel, not to the Gentiles. In fact, many people today, they run in and they pick what they like and what they want and say, this is what I'm going to preach in my church. This is a huge problem. There he is. Who's that? He's one of the number of Gentile pastors. <laughs> What's he got on the cart? The law. Baptism. The Great Commission. How many denominations are built around many of these things? Why steal what was given to Israel? To Israel only. Matthew 15, 24. When Christ was here on earth, what did he say? He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. His ministry on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was to Israel. A kingdom message, not to the Gentiles. Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. These twelve, the twelve apostles, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go amongst the Gentiles. Stay away from them. They're dogs. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Again, a dispensational theology, wonderful book by Charles Baker. The ministry of Pentecost and for some seven or eight years thereafter was to the Jews only. Let me just jog your memory a little bit. Remember lesson two on dispensations? We talked about the dispensation of promise. Remember here's Abram, Abraham, through him was started a new people called the Jews. And then came the dispensation of law. This was for the Jews only. Remember this now. When that happened, where were the Gentiles? Remember we talked about this. They were put on a shelf. And I want you to see this verse again. Boy, this should be underlined in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. All this time of the law. Therefore remember, says Paul, that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth. I'm a Gentile. Probably most of you are. And called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. That was a Jew. Remember that at that time, you, Gentiles, were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. See all those covenants? That was for Israel, not us. And the last part, we Gentiles during all this time period until the coming of Paul, and his conversion, we were without hope and without God in the world. Now, Gentiles were set aside the Tower of Babel. The nation Israel grew and became the chosen people. Now, with the coming of Paul, 
Both are set aside. Romans 11.11. 11. See, all this happened starting in Acts chapter 7. They had rejected the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hauled Stephen out, stoned him to death. There was a person there watching named Saul. Look what Romans 11.11 11 says. I say then, says Paul, have they stumbled? This is Israel. So that they should fall? Oh, God forbid, says Paul. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. See, prophecy says the Gentiles will be saved by Israel. But that won't happen until the tribulation and the 1,000 year reign of Christ. This is something different. But rather through Israel's fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. And remember, about A.D. 72, the Romans came in, pulverized Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and from that point on there was no temple, no priesthood, no sacrifices. Why was this done? To provoke them to jealousy. What a beautiful thing. Now can become a new program. Because now in Romans, Paul can say, there is none that seeketh after me or after Christ. Not one. Now is the start of something brand new. This is that message of reconciliation. Now Jew and Gentile are one to build up this body of Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. We are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. This is a dry baptism. We then put on Christ. Now there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, remember we started this out. Oh, the Bible is full of confusion. It's full of contradiction. Now you can see how the study of dispensations can solve most of the problems in the Bible. Now the confusion and so forth is changed into a clearness. The Bible is now clear. I can understand things. It is understandable. Because now with the study of dispensations, we can see what belongs to who. Why do we follow Paul today? Well, it's quite simple. Ephesians 3, 2. Paul says this, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word, it was given to Paul by the ascended Christ. Not Christ when he was here on earth. And it was given to us, the Gentiles, because Paul says, I am an apostle to the Gentiles. So, what's our battle today? I love this verse, Ephesians 3, 9. I take this as my charge. What I do with my little ministry. To make all men see what is the fellowship or the dispensation of the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Well, there he is. I call him Two Gun Pete. Well, who's he? Well, this battle, presenting this to people, we need two guns to win this battle. The first, this is one you've heard so many times, we must rightly divide the Word of God. Well, the problem is, how do you know what to rightly divide until you first study the Word of God dispensationally? Now you know what belongs to Israel, what belongs to the body of Christ, and you don't want to mix the two together. Well, 
Without these weapons, you'll get blown away. There's <laughs> our little cowboy again with his little pop gun. He doesn't understand all this. The Bible is confusion. Ephesians 4.14 Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching or different doctrines and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. There's a lot of religious programs on TV today that are teaching a totally different doctrine. So without those two weapons, you'll get blown away. Why do we need to study so much? Why is home Bible study so important? Well, we must study. There he is. Books out, papers out. He's studying the Word of God. Why? Ephesians 4.12. Now this is in the King James. For the perfecting of the saints. That's us. For the work of the ministry. In other words, we are to do it. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Here's the same verse in the NIV. Ephesians 4.12. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up and brought to completion. And then I'll close with this beautiful verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. He, Christ, has committed to us this message of reconciliation. The mystery. We are, says Paul, therefore Christ's ambassadors. Remember, Christ is in the heavenlies. We are his ambassadors representing him here on earth. As though God were making his appeal to the people here through us. Why do we need to study so much? To make ourselves approved unto God that we can be a tool that can be used by the Holy Spirit. And then he uses us through the Holy Spirit making appeals about this wonderful concept of reconciliations and so forth to other people and to lead them to Christ. So that's why we need to study. And that's why this message of dispensations is so vitally important.